Okay, been a while since I've done a tier list. Progressive metal is probably my favorite genre and also the genre I am most critiquing of. <laughs> Stuff that I love, I have higher standards for. Super quick before we get into it, I have two things. One, my band Crusade is playing this Sunday in Nashville, April 23rd, 7 p.m. at the East Room. Come see us, would love to see you guys. It's worth traveling for. Come have an awesome time. Come say hi to me, come say hi to the band. Love to see you there. And years ago, I was doing a series where I would have you guys email me songs of yours that you're either working on or that you've published already and getting my feedback on it in a video. I'm thinking I wanna resurrect that series. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments below and uh, maybe we'll bring that back. All right, enough chit chat. Let's talk about progressive metal bands. So the rankings are S, A, B, C, D, and F as the very bottom. I don't truly believe any band on this list is a real F in comparison to a bunch of other bands out there, but there's an F, so someone has to go an F today. And that person is Cynic. I will say Cynic has made a valiant effort to try and give honest expression. I believe it's coming from a place for them that's inspiration. The production is consistently crap. I gotta say, it's really not good. I listened to snippets of their latest two albums and the production got way better, but then comes the other problem. There are some interesting songwriting moments every once in a while that's really punctuated by, I just think, underdeveloped, not as cohesive ideas as they could be. I just don't have full faith in these guys as writers. Getting their production game up would help substantially, which it has on later albums, that, and they've definitely tried to modernize somewhat. But even with that more polished and more focused sound, it's still not getting me the whole way there. All right, D tier, Fate's Morning. Now, I mean, to a degree, is this completely fair? No, it's not completely fair. Fate's Morning, barely gets to be considered prog because they're really like the proto prog. It's arguable that they're not even really a progressive metal band, but there wouldn't be any progressive metal bands without them. So, you know, it's kind of on that fine line. It's like in retrospect years from now, you could make an argument that Black Sabbath isn't metal, even though they're the first metal band. Like, it's that kind of thing. I wouldn't say I have any real hate or big distaste towards Fate's Warning. It's just all kind of blanketly new wave of British heavy metal, maybe a little bit of American hair rock, hair metal in there. It's not quite as formulaic in the song structures or how they stack their melodies, but they use a lot of the same tropes and stylings, and I don't think they do it in a really engaging way. I appreciate their experimentation, and I'm sure part of why it doesn't come across exactly as prog to me is because I'm not taking into context everything else that was happening around the time when they released that music. But just from a very fundamental place, like, does this move me? Does this engage me? Does this feel fulfilling? Fate's Warning doesn't hit for me. I can absolutely see why at the time people thought, wow, this is neat, this is different. I, I can picture that in my brain but I don't know that it stands the test of time. Okay, so these next tiers have more than one band in them. So I'm going to go lowest tier, and as we move this way, that's gonna be higher. That's how I'm doing this tier list. In C tier, we have Ne Obliviscaris. I kind of find it hilarious that they're included in this tier list when whoever made this has glaring oversights like missing Devin Townsend Project or Coheed and Cambria. I'm not saying they shouldn't be included on the tier list, just like, I, where, where are you getting your frame of reference? <laughs> Either way. Nebla Viscaris is trying to do something progressive, specifically in the death metal realm. And like, especially on many of the earlier tracks, you can hear a pretty strong Opeth style influence, though I wouldn't call it really Opeth. Their biggest weak spots for me has been production consistency. It's never been that fabulous. Even on their latest record, which is done by Mark Lewis, who is a badass, legendary metal producer, likes keeping things as natural as possible, it still didn't fully come across to me, and that might even just be a composition and arranging thing. Mark Lewis's record is hands down the best production they've had, plain and simple. It seems like they're more focused on creating soundscape moods than they are delivering melodic information and clear, concise ideas. Some people may be really into that, 
That's a lot less my thing, not as into that. I prefer at some point that the melody be the star of the show, even if they're co-starring with a bunch of other melodies. And they try to sell you on this violin thing, which I think is cool in concept, but they've yet to fully sell me on the idea. When and Plower, what's it called? And Flowers Plague the Kaleidoscope. If I could talk right, this would be amazing. I think that's the closest they've gotten to really achieving what they're trying to sell to us, and I don't feel like they've quite gotten back to that. Not a terrible band by any means, but I feel like they need a pivot and a focus and, and a, a good producer who is willing to tell them no to help them get there. Next up on the list is Queensryche. If Fate's Warning doesn't technically qualify as the first progressive metal band, then Queensryche is definitely the first progressive metal band. I'd say there's a lot of similarities between Queensryche and Fate's Warning, especially with that strong New Wave of British heavy metal influence, which probably my biggest criticism of Queensryche is it just sounds like slightly more complicated Iron Maiden with more controlled vocals. I don't love or hate Jeff Tate. It's definitely very cheesy and of its time and hasn't aged incredibly well in my opinion, but that doesn't mean it's terrible by any means. Now, as opposed to Fate's Warning, like I said, there are those moments of experimentation that actually perk my ears up for a second. I rarely find that it fully pays off for me. Every once in a while, there'll be like a gem in the rough where I'm like, mm, that was like dead on, really cool. Queensryche are obviously genuinely themselves, but as you'll listen through the catalog, there's not a ton of development that happens over time. There is some, there's definitely some, but it's a lot of sameness. I don't see them taking shitloads of chances or risks. And when I listen to your 2020 record or somewhere around that time, and it still sounds like it could have come out in 1998, then I, I'm a little questioning on how much you're actually prog. Next up, Arion. Arion is basically a one-man project of Aryan Lucasan. Aryan Lucasan. Sorry, I'm terrible at pronouncing things right now. And he is very good, but also incredibly cheesy. <laughs> I have an appreciation for him trying to have these grandiose concepts that he wants to play out in musical form as if it were a stage play. That's actually very admirable. And there's times where I think he hits it really well. I love that he gets buttloads of super cool guest vocalists on there. Years ago, I thought the production was very, very good. And years later, now that I know more and have more practiced ears, I'm like, hmm, don't, don't know about this production as much. <laughs> this tends to be the case in a lot of progressive metal and even progressive rock songs. Some of this can really be bloated. I feel like you can trim out certain bits and tighten this up to have a more effective experience. A lot of the more extended parts that you could consider bloated, I think rely on you really enjoying the timbres. And some of the timbres are, I, I hate saying this, but kind of dorky. So just instantly, I think it's gonna be pretty polarizing. I still think Aryan is a great writer, absolutely. Um, he is a good producer and he's got some really fun concepts, but it just hasn't fully sold me on one record yet. All right, here come the unsubscribe Symphony X and C tier. Ooh, oh, how dare, et tu brutai. They are all insanely accomplished musicians. Some of the best, hands down. As far as like being the kings of a certain kind of progressive metal sound, it was basically Symphony X and Dream Theater jockeying for that, and I feel like Dream Theater always won out for two reasons. One, consistently better production. Symphony X's later catalog definitely got better on the production side, but then there's the other factor. I think Dream Theater are better songwriters. You can definitely say Russell Allen is a more impressive and better vocalist than James Labrie. I, I can completely see that argument, but at the end of the day, he didn't sing lines that were as engaging to me. If you really wanna make the argument, there's a reason why Dream Theater has a hit song and Symphony X does not. I think that explains it enough right there. No hate to Symphony X, no hate to people that love them. I, I get why you would think Symphony X is way better than Dream Theater. I just think you're wrong. That's all there is to it. First in B tier, Liquid Tension Experiment. For most of it, I believe it's been Mike Portnoy, John Petrucci, uh, Jordan Rudess, and the fucking guy from King Crimson, what's his name? Tony Levin, on the bay, oh, playing the Chapman stick, not technically bass guitar. It's a progressive metal super group, and, okay, here's a few things. I love that as a progressive metal side project, these guys just get to spread their wings a little bit, not worry as much about weird things like focus and arrangement synergy. Even though these are all 
definitely pretty strict compositions. It kind of reminds me if progressive metal had a jam band. That as a concept I think is really cool. As a matter of fact, the song that's being advertised above me right now, Goful Epic, is my attempt at trying to write something that is like a progressive metal jam band. I like the concept in theory. Execution is very difficult. And just because of the nature of both jam band and progressive metal, narrowing your audience substantially. There are plenty of fun moments, though I would say not all of it's very gripping to me, though Acid Rain is a banger front to back, period. Acid Rain is delicious. If you haven't listened to Acid Rain by Liquid Tension Experiment, you should. All right, next up, B tier is Tesseract. They were popping up about the same time as Periphery, if I remember correctly, and they're kind of like uh, brothers from the same egg almost. When I was in college, which was early for both of their careers, I always felt like Tesseract was the lesser fun periphery. Like they're good. They're absolutely good. I get the appeal, especially with how spacey they try to be. They, they do the heady thing. Instead of doing shitloads of math, they have it be usually more simplified math that's just a lot more atmospheric in a lot of ways hear me out they remind me of like a millennial style tool with metalcore sensibilities instead of a more grunge sensibility this may be a band that i come back to years later and be like oh finally clicks i get it now like that's happened to a number of different bands just over the last few years but as of now it's not clicking with me i don't get it I acknowledge their massive influence is like them and the contortionist I put in very similar kind of boats that way. I hear Tesseract's influence on a ton of new acts today, but it's not it's not doing it for me. Next up, Haken. Now I know what I'm about to say is not completely accurate because I have a limited perspective on this, but when I heard Haken, I was like, oh, these are the guys trying to carry the mantle for Dream Theater in this generation. And I, I mean that in a good way. You can hear a lot of the classic prog rock influences all throughout with a different style of metal thrown in that isn't just John Petrucci worship. Really appreciate that. I also love that I can hear a clear progression of the band from album to album and an album like Virus where they're almost trying to tap a little more into the trendier, genty ish kind of genre, which not everyone loved. I thought it was actually kind of refreshing, weirdly enough, to, to get their take on it. And I'm happy they didn't stay there. I'm very happy they didn't stay there. Even this latest album has taken a while for it to click with me fully. I acknowledge as I'm listening to these songs like, OK, there's some really good stuff here. It hasn't fully given me a payoff. And I think it might be the vocals. Ross Jennings is an awesome vocalist. He is very good. I don't know if he's a great metal vocalist. He's a great prog vocalist in certain circumstances, absolutely, especially since he does have a, a fun range of expression. But when it gets to metal sections, I feel like I want more balls out of him. I want more just like rage and pissedness. I want to fully believe and what you're singing. And there's certain moments where he does it, and there's certain moments where he doesn't. Instrumentally speaking, there's a lot of really cool concepts throughout the entire catalog. So, I mean, even though I wouldn't say I'm in love, I would have to say a lot of respect. Next up, Riverside. As far as I can tell in the prog world, both metal and rock, these guys have a shitload of influence, like, the way that you have the massively cult following of Porcupine Tree, I feel like everyone secretly loves Riverside except me. <laughs> I don't think I've ever had a distaste for Riverside. It's just always so chill and subdued. It's very British in that way. I don't even know if they're a British band, but it feels very British and always just like kind of. <laughs> Sometimes it clicks with me. Other times, I'm just kind of like, eh, I got other things to do, you know? <laughs> I think they're great writers. I think they're really good at sound design in their own way. There are times where I wish there is a bigger climactic payoff in certain sections, but they want to keep that cleanliness of timbre, and I, I fully understand from a certain perspective why they want to do that. It just doesn't appeal to me as much. Like, on someone else's tier list, if they put them in S tier, 
I wouldn't myself agree, but would completely understand. They are so prolific, and I catch Riverside more in bits and random pieces throughout the place instead of focusing on like, okay, I'm listening through this part of the catalog and this part of the catalog. I can't say how much they've actually developed over the years or not. I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable talking about that. But based upon what I have heard, I wouldn't be surprised if there is a clear development, even though they maintain that always very subtle chillaxed type of vibe. Next up, Meshuga. There are some people who would put Meshuga in S tier, and I think it really depends upon what about the progressiveness we're valuing here. If we're talking about evolution of a sound, Meshuga has not evolved that much. I mean, you can hear a clear evolution from album to album, but it's mostly pretty much the same. You know exactly what to expect. Um, me and some friends kind of compare listening to Meshuga to like listening to Ingve Malmsteen. In the right circumstances, they hit so great, so awesome, but no more than like four songs of that in one month because it, it just all starts to blend together. It's all very much the same mood for a lot of it. And... I don't consider that very prog. Meshuggah, 10,000% are pioneers, and that in its own way is progressive, you know, for sure. Um, I just don't see them consistently trying to get a wider range of expression. Not saying they have to by any means, but, you know, I don't know. That's part of a prog thing by my own estimation, so I'm not sure. I can only take so much Meshuggah, but... They're arguably one of the most important metal bands, especially to the modern metal sound that we're in right now. Speaking of Meshuggah, next up we have Periphery. Love that shit! Speaking of Periphery, the first vocalist of Periphery, Casey Sable, is a co-host on my podcast, and we just released a new episode this week. You should go check that out. Link's in the description. But talking about the band, Misha has an obsession with Meshuggah, which is why there is a ton of similarities between Periphery and Meshuggah, though definitely not the same. I feel like especially for the time that Periphery really broke through with P1, they took the Meshuggah sound in a much needed fresher direction that Meshuggah wasn't doing themselves and adding some really cool context. And then you had the development into P2, where that got even more defined. And then you got into Juggernaut, which was like, oh, they're starting to get more focused, definitely more in the proggy realm, where it's less about having these one punchy in the face songs and more about an overall album mood. And by the way, my favorite is Juggernaut Alpha of all of them. But I will say, it seems like since Juggernaut, there's been a smidge of stagnation in sound. Not that they haven't been trying new things. There's definitely some trying of new things. But there's a whole lot of, okay, yeah, it sound, sounds like Periphery. Some people are really into that. There's people who still love every new Periphery release, and I'm happy for you. Enjoy it. They, they put a lot of work into what they do. They put a lot of care. They give a shit. The interesting thing about Periphery is I don't think they were ever really trying to be a progressive metal band. They just wanted to make music that they love making, and that happened to fall into prog more than any other category, so that's kind of just where they landed. And that's probably the biggest reason why they're in B tier instead of A tier, frankly. It's not because they're bad at what they do. It's because they're not really as prog as you can be with being purist of prog shit, you know? Still a fucking great band, but not as progressive if, if we're going to uh, use that as a measuring stick on this tier list. Next up in B tier, Pain of Salvation. I was wrong about these guys. I'm almost considering making a whole video dedicated to talking about why I was wrong about these guys. You guys have suggested them multiple times on the live streams, and I don't know why you decided to pick almost exclusively songs where Daniel Gildenlow sings like fucking Dracula. Like, there are aspects of his vocal performance that are a very real acquired taste, but having the context of knowing fully what he is capable of helps when knowing, okay, I'm making these weird, awkward sounds as an affect, not just because I'm a bad singer. The guy is an incredible singer, insanely good singer. The guy is an insanely good writer. He writes a, a ton of awesome melodies. So why isn't Pain of Salvation in A or S tier? Couple things. One, I don't agree with all of the production decisions. As far as him wanting a somewhat unique sound that is helping with the timbres communicating the emotions he wants to do. I think he does that pretty dang well. 
but I feel like it could have clinically hit better. And then the question becomes, the more clinical and clean you become, how much of the rawness are you sacrificing? And that's actually one of the things I really like about Pain of Salvation is how raw they are. The other thing I would say, sometimes Pain of Salvation gets a little bit up their own ass. There are times when it kind of seems like, all right, I get the point, can you move on? Can we, can we move on here? Or other times where the lyrics just get a little bit too preachy. And I don't think it's just the lyrical content, it's how he sings it and emotes those lyrics to where it's contextualized to like, okay, yeah, 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 okay, I gotcha. I will say there's never been lyrical or vocal moments that have totally thrown me off with my latest listens. On Song Suggestion Friday, there were definitely <laughs> lyrical and vocal moments that pissed me off. <laughs> Comparing those two listening environments will be for a different video. But I'm happy to say I was wrong about Pain of Salvation. I'm happy to be wrong about Pain of Salvation. And um, I would love to put them higher because they have some really cool concepts and some great albums, but it's not quite A tier for me. It's really fucking close though. Next up, Between the Buried and Me. These guys are insanely talented, some of the best uh, friggin' technicians and musicians today. I think they are very good writers. My thing, my personal thing, where Opeth tries to do the Swedish death metal thing and reinterpret that through a prog lens, Between the Buried Me is taking more of an American death metal and using a, a random prog lens, for lack of a better term. A lot of it seems really random. I am more than willing to admit some of these songs, most of these songs and albums, I imagine, take a couple listens to fully digest. I completely get that. At the same time, I am very turned off by the death metal parts. They never appealed to me with them or any other band that does that to where I just really don't want to take the time to go through another listen. I really don't. And that's not something bad about them as a band. That is just my own personal preferences. I can't help but still think, even my personal preferences aside, it does feel very unfocused. There are some moments of genius that come through in certain sections that I feel like get subverted sometimes. And I don't know. I don't know. It's never fully clicked with me. Extreme respect for these guys, obviously. But I think just my own personal bias against American style death metal puts them lower on the list for me. All right, A tier, we got Mastodon. I've talked so much about Mastodon in multiple different videos. I'm gonna sum this up pretty quickly. They have a more stoner, orange cabinet guitar style sound that I've never found extremely appealing but I know they definitely write some cool ideas like any other prog project. They kind of ramble for a bit sometimes, but some people consider that a really nice mood to sink into. Uh, the vocals are interesting. I could say maybe polarizing, but I happen to think that they fit the sound very well. The only song of theirs that I've ever consistently come back to is The Last Baron. The rest of it, I never really feel the need to come back to, even though they're in A tier because it never really pisses me off, and their influence is outsized for their genre. Absolutely. So, there you go. Moving on. Next up, Gojira. How a group of Frenchmen made it into the A tier, I will never know, but there you go. Again, I've also talked extensively about Gojira. I don't think there's a whole lot more I can add to it, so I'll try and sum it up pretty quickly. Uh, Gojira do big, heavy riffs. They rely a ton on timbre and a lot less on songwriting prowess or technical prowess. And there's something kind of cool about that. I can get that. That also means it's very production dependent. And I don't always think their production perfectly serves the mood, but it's probably also music that's meant to be played super freaking loud, which I don't always listen to music super freaking loud. From a raw attitude brutality perspective, they have a unique niche that they've carved out, and that is super respectable. Not only that, but they don't want to do exactly the same thing. I hear a clear progression over time. Even though I don't even always agree with their decisions, I can at least be like, okay, these guys are trying to say something new, definitively. My biggest critique from a personal level is I find the composition lacking. I feel like I want more information and less repetition. 
but that probably goes against the ethos of what Gojira are trying to do. Next up, Tool. I made an entire long video on Tool and I've talked about them extensively. The biggest thing I would say is they barely qualify as metal. <laughs> By the way, I'm not trying to gatekeep. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think it's really cool that they barely qualify as metal and they technically qualify as prog because they have very little of the traditional influences and elements that you would expect from prog rock or progressive metal. That's all really cool to me. If you want to hear more of my thoughts on Tool, look at my video about it. I do not love Tool. I respect Tool. And I, I have to give them credit for how raw and real it all feels. That paired with their influence is, I think, why I put them in A tier as opposed to B tier. Because even though it's not that appealing to me, I have to say... They bring a fresh aspect to prog metal, barely being prog metal. They bring a fresh aspect that almost no other band brings, and I think that's really important. Next up, Leprous in S tier. Yes, I think Leprous has earned S tier with their Aphelion album. Their production and mixing consistently gets better from album to album. This last one, I would say the production and mixing is arguably flawless. It took a while for the new album to grow on me. I think partly because of the non-standard song structures that they employ and also how each section of the song is also non-standard. It took a while for that to sink into me, but once it sunk in, I was like, oh, wow, this is probably the best album they've ever released. I talked for a good while about Leprous in my Metallica 72 Seasons review. That was funny. So if you want to hear more of my thoughts on them, you can check that out. Or I also talked about them in my Rock Isn't Dead video that's somewhere around. Uh, that I talked about Leprous a lot. To me, I think this is the future of Prague that I'm really interested in. And a big component of that that most of the other bands on this list are completely missing is accessibility. This is accessible to a modern average audience, in my opinion. It's going to be a little off for them at first but it's not going to be so off. It's completely unadmissible. It's completely unappealing. It'll take them a moment because there's like there's things that I find pleasing about this, but there's other things that are throwing me off. Maybe I should give this another listen. That's what you want. If you want to help audiences grow an appreciation for a non-standard genre of music, you have to meet them somewhere where they're at. Leprous does that amazingly. Next up. Animals as leaders. I'm putting them in S tier. I don't love this band. I'm putting them in S tier because one, I mean, obviously some of the most talented musicians living today, but two, the level of influence that Animals as leaders had paired with like the periphery thing. These two guys basically launched metal and virtuoso guitar for the 2010s and onward. Tosin Abasi pioneered a whole bunch of different sounds and techniques on the instrument. He's absolutely ridiculous. Even though, in my opinion, it can get a little bit up their own ass, just a smidge. There's even several songs from theirs that I still love. I still put on. These guys kick ass, sometimes very difficult to digest, but I have to admire they're constantly trying to pioneer and experiment. And they have an outsized influence considering their following isn't mainstream, I would argue. Next in S tier, Opeth. I've talked extensively about Opeth. I have too many videos about Opeth. I think this comes as no surprise. I guess I'll sum up why I put them near the top of the list, besides my own biases, is that I think they very much embody the spirit of Prague. They have consistently evolved throughout their entire catalog. It is obvious. Even though you can even split each of these up into eras, in each era, there's a clear evolution from album to album. None of them really sound the same. And while Opeth do not have as much of an accessibility factor as Leprous, I would say, they have an outsized influence because they tap both into that more European metal side as well as the dorky, softy prog side. Last but not least, obviously, Dream Theater. I mean, this is no surprise to anyone. What Fate's Warning and Queensryche started, Dream Theater kind of perfected. They became the quintessential sound of progressive metal. If you hear a Dream Theater clone, you don't normally think, oh, it's a Dream Theater clone. You think, oh, that's progressive metal. Even though we've determined on the live stream that all music is a Dream Theater clone, Dream Theater is the origin of music. So Beethoven, Dream Theater clone. Uh, Chopin, Dream Theater clone. Bob Dylan, 
Dream Theater, obviously Dream Theater clone. Why wouldn't he be? I've talked about Dream Theater extensively, so I'm not gonna say much more on it other than there's my tier list. Do you agree or disagree? I guess I would put Devin Townsend and Coheed and Cambria in A for the record. Oh, and uh, Volvoid or Voivod or whatever they're called, the, those freaking um, progressive thrash guys, I'd toss them in B. That'll do it for me. Uh, love you guys. Stay amazing. Bye-bye.